Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for the French Wine Academy session four, a session that's based about the wines of Bordeaux. Now, session four may concern some of you like you've missed uh, sessions one through three, but don't worry. You have missed them, but you can always go back and just drink through them as well. We'll make limited references to those sessions as we progress through the wines of Bordeaux, but there'll be, they will be fairly limited. So you can always just drink with us through this session. Now, I say that, but I want to hearken back to our second session together where we talked about the wines of Burgundy. And the reason I want to do that is because oftentimes, and we said it in the past session, Burgundy is regarded as the soul of France. And I think many, many people in this day and age look to Burgundy to be the full expression of wines that taste like the place they're from. The real living embodiment to the idea of terroir. Now this is a little bit of contrast to that because oftentimes I believe people look on Bordeaux as the commercial center of France. And certainly that commercialism of wine began a long time ago in the 12th century. And it's progressed to this day. Now there is no other place in the world that can claim that kind of legacy for producing fine wines and producing fine wines at exceptional prices. So while Burgundy may be the soul of French wine, certainly Bordeaux is the one that lends claim to the prize of being the absolute top or the king of wines evaluated on price. Now that being said, we're gonna use this lecture to explore the wines of Bordeaux in several different ways. I don't want to lose our Burgundian thought process about terroir. I still want to think about the idea that these wines taste like the place that they're from, and that's going to be our designated first flight. Then in the second flight, we're going to explore something quite unusual, and it's unique to Bordeaux, which is a classification system on top of all our other classification systems that we see that only Bordeaux has. In the third flight, we're going to go off and explore some controversies in Bordeaux, ones that I think are very relevant to your drinking and also relevant to Bordeaux in this day and age. Throughout the entire time, I hope to use Bordeaux's history and culture and, of course, taste you through all these wines to get us understanding more of what's going on in Bordeaux and why it has been so preeminent for at least eight centuries. Now, backing up a little bit, what we're going to do is we're going to have a series of flights. We're going to have 10 wines in total. We always like to do a bonus wine at the start, so we had a Bordeaux Blanc to start. Bordeaux Blanc, or white wines from Bordeaux, account for about 10% of the production. So, you know, Bordeaux is very much heavily aimed at red wine, but there's still some gorgeous white wines. The rest of the tasting, however, is going to be all red wines, and we're going to take them in a series of uh, flights, three wines each flight. Now on the website, waterfordwine.com, you're going to find both the course material as well as the wines for purchase, and you can purchase them at a discount. So if you'd like to join us in tasting, you can buy them as a full set of nine, you can buy them as a set of three, or you can work through them one by one. It's all there and available to you on the website. For us though, we're going to taste and go through these wines and take them in that series of flights because I really believe it's a great way to explore these wines and get the full impression of what's going on with these wines. Okay, with that being said, I hate to leave anyone dry. So no matter what you're doing, I would suggest you start drinking through these flights while I'm speaking. I know that I get more interesting the more I drink, and I'm certain that you'll find me more interesting the more you drink. So please, feel free to taste through these wines at all times. I would just say, leave a little bit for when I get to the wine, and we can taste it together. Or, if you're not having the exact same wine that we have, maybe we can taste something together and kind of share some thoughts about what we think in the particular categories or what I was aiming at. Okay, with that, let's begin on this first flight. Now with this first flight, I really wanted to hold the impression that Bordeaux has a sense of place. We experienced that very strongly in Burgundy. We also experienced it in the Rhone, and so I want to make sure we feel it here as well. 
And furthermore, I think that sense of place really ties into historical traditions in Bordeaux that illuminate these wines, and also some cultural traditions in Bordeaux which give us great insight to them. So with that, I can't resist. I have to do instant cartography. So now, if my cartography on this whiteboard doesn't show up or looks erratic or not to scale, please feel free to just open a book or a web page and Google Bordeaux and you'll have all the answers right in front of you. But what I'll do first is give you a map of France. Here we go. Here, and we'll segment it out. We'll put in, as always, there. It's not a bad France. Spain down here, Italy, the rather oversized Switzerland, Germany, the Low Countries. And we'll draw in Paris right here. Okay. Well, where is Bordeaux exactly? Bordeaux actually sits in a cut from the Atlantic Ocean right here, Bordeaux, the town of Bordeaux. It's fairly far south in France, and it was actually a little bit to my shock that it's about 160 kilometers down into Spain, so it's not that far from Spain at all. Bordeaux, though, has this really unique environment with that cut going on to the Pacific Ocean, and I'm going to blow that up to give you some of the geography, the greater geography of Bordeaux. So if out here we put the Atlantic Ocean, and we go in and we have this cut, this estuary from the Atlantic Ocean down, we then get a separation of two river systems that are going to make up the entirety of Bordeaux. Now the estuary is known as the Gironde, and this one is the Dorbonne and the Garonne down here. And so estuary and two river systems, and the town of Bordeaux sits right about here. Now this makes Bordeaux ideal for a couple of things, and one of the probably earliest interesting things it makes it ideal for is, maybe not ideal is not the greatest word, but it makes it a place where it's uh, possible to do, is of course grow grapes. And the earliest uh, recollection or uh, historical record of growing grapes actually comes from Roman times and around 600 AD. Now, after that, because of the Visigoths and the tribes coming into Bordeaux, we lose touch with Bordeaux for a little bit in terms of grape production until we get rediscovered or reacquainted with Bordeaux with Eleanor of Antiquain, excuse me, in the 12th century. Eleanor of Antiquain was, of course, French, but she married the English king. And with that, much of her French holdings suddenly became English. Now, you can imagine in all the disputes that are going to follow, and even to this day, that the French and English had complications with that relationship. Okay, I'm guessing that you haven't tasted in a little bit, so I'm going to go ahead and have this first wine. This will give you a natural pause to taste as well. Mm. And reflect on its characteristics. It's a beautiful mix of black fruit and red fruits. Also its sense of gravel, minerality on the palate. Um, and it's kind of taunt acidity to it. A lot of us are familiar with Merlot and Cab and we're gonna experience these wines, but we're not necessarily familiar with them here, and I think it's interesting in using this one as an introduction to it. So go ahead and keep tasting. Of course, if you bought a whole bottle, you can taste a lot, whereas I should probably taste just a little bit more minimally. Okay, historically, let's go back to that Eleanor of Antiquain. What it meant is all, almost all, of this territory suddenly became English. Now the interesting thing there is the English is a, the Eng, England is a very thirsty nation, and also King Henry was very very pressed to try and treat all of his new French subjects as gently as he could, so they wouldn't rebel and immediately go back to France. So what he did was pass incredibly favorable trade laws that French wine would always be the cheapest flowing into England. Given this and the thirst of England, there was a massive boom, and again, this is in the 12th century, a massive boom of wine flowing out of Bordeaux and going up into England. 
This is the start of Bordeaux's commercial success. It's a commercial success that continues on into this day. So I think a fascinating way to appreciate what's going on in Bordeaux. Well, where was that success specifically based in Bordeaux and how does it relate down into that first glass of wine? Because I think that's really important. Those early successes were actually based here, now just extending outside of the city of um, Bordeaux, but going down fairly far south. And this gives rise to one of our three major regions of Bordeaux, and that's Graz. Now, I have to say, I train a lot of my employees on Bordeaux, and oftentimes they uh, get a little bit flummoxed, like there's a lot to learn or a lot to memorize. And I would say it actually breaks down very nicely and simply. We experienced Burgundy together, some of us experienced Burgundy together, where the answers were a lot of complexity and wonderful and delicious complexity on and on in Burgundy. Whereas here, it really is going to simplify quite neatly and nicely. And furthermore, it's going to simplify using English nouns instead of French nouns because of the tradition, making it really exciting and super smooth to learn what Bordeaux is all about. So here's Grave. Now why Grave and why so far south? So why and what does this do? Well, Grave was the region, and maybe this highlights it for you, Grave is the region that is going to actually have the name that's appropriate for the soil. Grave, Grave, Grave. So that's the soil that you see in Grave, and it's most common in Grave. And indeed, all Grave wines, like this one, and this one comes from a subregion called Pesach Liagnan, if you want to win the bonus test at the end. But all Grave wines to me have this certain sense of earthy minerality to it. Now you can think about it however you want to, and you don't have to use my descriptions. But I think when you smell the other two wines in this flight, this one has something unique to it. And it's that sense of just a little bit of earthiness, just a little bit more minerality to it. And Grab wines really share that. And I think across and up and down, it's a common trait, and it very distinctly links to the soil. So it's one of the major three soils, or excuse me, one of the major three regions that we're going to experience when we taste Bordeaux. Now, this was the region first planted and first commercially successful because it was well-drained soils and it had easy access to a river system. Now, the well-drained soils are important and in contrast to the place we're going to taste next, which was right up here, well-drained soils were not present. In fact, it was a swamp. So it doesn't experience commercial success until much, much later. The other thing is, if you're on a river and you're in the 12th century, you have an easy access to be able to transport your heavy product to market. Wine is not light. Even in this day and age, transporting wine across the world is an expense that is noticeable. Here, you can stick it on a boat and you can send it out. And you've got easy access to the ocean. And of course, that means easy access to your most major market. England. Okay, but for the taste of the wines, here down in Grab, again, I think it's our start with Bordeaux, and I think it's a beautiful combination of that gravel, minerality, and then some other things that we can pick out. Now, if you've downloaded the tasting sheet, you'll notice that we are dealing with a blend. Bordeaux is always going to be a family of grape varieties, very different than Burgundy, which is almost always a mono variety. It's almost always strictly Pinot Noir for red wine. Here we have a family, and I think the idea is that the family together makes the wine greater than if they were separate. And the family is going to be Cab, uh, in Cabernet Sauvignon, I should say, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, and then Malbec. There is Carmenere, and to my understanding, uh, Bordeaux opened up many new varieties to be planted legally in Bordeaux with the worry of global warming coming. But the main varieties being Cabernet and Merlot. Now one of the nice easy things we can know is 
almost all grave wine, it's not a rule and it's not a law, but almost all grave wine is based on Cabernet. So one of the things we could do is if we were in a French restaurant and we don't speak French, but we want to have a Cabernet, we can order a grave. And we're almost always going to get something dominated by Cabernet. Or if we're in an American restaurant and we want to look a little snooty, we can order a French wine from Grave and also realize that we're getting a Cabernet. But to me, here's a glimpse at understanding the history and then also why the wine tastes like it does and then that its main makeup would be Cabernet. Okay, let's take a little shift and let's go to another area of Bordeaux. And that other area of Bordeaux actually has quite a few names to it, and we'll go fairly far into those other names, but it also simplifies down very nicely. That other area of Bordeaux is right here, and it is to the French known as the Médoc. Now you rarely ever say Médoc on the label. Sometimes you see Beau Médoc, and the reason is that we're gonna explore a little bit further in the next flight of wines. But the Médoc is this area. Now the Maydoc has a couple of nicknames which are fairly famous to it and they're nice and easy because they come to us in English. What's one of the nicknames? It's the left bank. Well what the heck does the left bank mean? Left bank is actually if you're a shipper and you're going up the Gironde estuary out to your markets, what's on your left hand side? The left bank of the river. So the left bank. You'll hear this even to this day, and you'll read it in wine magazines quite frequently, that the Medoc wines are left bank wines. So in fact, because Medoc is used less frequently, most people just say left, or Medoc is used less frequently, most people just say left bank. So super handy. Now the other interesting one here that's become a little bit more of common parlance is claret. Now, what is claret? Claret is actually the British nickname for wine that tastes like it comes from Bordeaux. Back in the 12th century, and this will continue until the early 1400s, back in those times, you didn't have as much designation and you didn't have people bottling their own wine. Most of it was shipped in bulk. And so London merchants would sell wine as a wine that tastes like it came from Bordeaux. And the English being the English and liking to affix their own proper nouns to things that are already named, they named it Claret. Now, here in this country, in the US, we now have a resurgence of the term Claret. Francis Ford Coppola is probably the one that produces the most under that term. So what's it mean again? It means a wine that tastes like it's from Bordeaux. Very simple, easy way to make it work. Now, for us, I wanted to pour us an example that I particularly like, and it's Les Ormes de Pez. It's from 2015. And I think we can tie a couple of interesting things together here. Now, while Grave has the soil of gravel, once you move into the left bank, you encounter a very different soil system. One of the fascinating things is to go back in history and to understand that it's not until the 1700s that the Dutch come to the left bank. And what are the Dutch great at doing? They are great at producing land from water. So before the Dutch come, the left bank is actually a swamp and relatively not a great place to plant, and certainly there was very few grapevines there as grains were considered a better thing to plant. The Dutch come and they drain it, and then what happens is the great English switch. Even though the English and French were still at war, again, starting in the 1700s, the English move in, and what are they moving in for? They're moving in for commercial interest. So they start, changing the left bank into the great estates that we know today. This is actually why you get some kind of funky names going on in Bordeaux, like Leoville Barton. You would think it would be Leoville Barton if it was French, but Leoville Barton, the Barton part of it was actually an Irish merchant 
who moved down and established his own merchant shipping company, which still exists today, and he was one of the first, and then he ended up buying a famous chateau. It's also why you have wines like Talbot, which I believe is actually pronounced Talbot, uh, as opposed to Talbot, named after the English general. So it's really the English, after the Dutch, who start planting here in this area in order to have significant supply of their favorite wine, Claret. Okay, now one thing you'll notice on the tasting sheets is that this wine is still a blend, but we have a fairly high percentage, and it's almost always dominant, is Cabernet. So once again, we have, woo, can't spell in any language, so we'll give it a second try. Cabernet and Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's still a blend, but we have a good significant percentage of Cabernet. Now this is really the home of Cabernet, and it's where all the great estates that you hear about, Latour and Lafitte, are producing what many people think of as the greatest Cabernets in the world. And certainly if you've gone out to Napa, while they may not say it now, there's still a little bit of a chip on the shoulder that they're trying to meet up or be as good as French Cabernet from the left bank. Now with this though, when you smell this wine, you can sense, I think, a bit of a change. To me, a little bit of the gravel, a little bit of the mineral, a little bit of the earthy character is gone from this wine meaning the Les Ormes de Pez, the second wine, doesn't have the same earthiness or minerality as the first wine. Instead, what I think you get is a little bit brighter red cherry fruit character to it. It still has those blackberry, black currant notes of Cabernet, but then you also get mm, uh, wine people like to say pencil shavings or pencil lead uh, to it, maybe a little bit of cedar. Overall, I would say a little bit higher toned in its fruit character, a little less earthy, still has a bit of the savory edge, but it comes in that kind of pencil lead character to it. So different than we just had. And I'll take a drink just to guarantee that. Mm. As you should too. Now the reason for that, I think is a couple of things. And one of the major things is that well, this is the gravel soil type. Up here, you get a complex mixture of gravel, limestone, and then sometimes clay. And gravel and limestone, or excuse me, limestone will often change wines, is the thought, and change the wines to make them maybe a little bit more linear, meaning they're a little bit more taut across the palate, a little bit tighter, uh, which would make them, of course, longer lived. And then clay has this affinity for Merlot, or Merlot has an affinity for clay, which we're gonna experience much more in the next wine. But a very complex soil structure to these wines, making them into something different. And I think you can taste it here. Again, I would summarize it by saying that it's a little bit brighter fruit character, a little bit more structured and tense across the palate as well. Now it leads us to a thought that we can explore as we go on here, but many Bordeaux wines are designed to be aged. So they're actually released in a very funny or unique fashion. They're sold on futures two years before they hit the bottle, but the idea is that you're going to age them. And so with this in our tasting of La Zorme de Pez 15, if this wine seems a little bit tight as wine people would say, you two totally need <laughs> uh, as a lot of people would say, I would suggest to you that it just needs a little bit more time and bottle to really open up and blossom. And that is somewhat the glory of Bordeaux, is that as it ages, it becomes something super special as time gives it more unique characters. Okay, so we have Grave to recap, which is in the south. We have the left bank, which makes claret wine over on the left bank of the Gironde estuary. Well, what else do we have? And this is, again, the wonderful thing about Bordeaux. We have something fairly easy up here. Uh, we have the right bank. Okay, now why is it the right bank? It's actually centered around the town of saint Emilion here. And saint Emilion has another tiny little winemaking area next to it called Palmerol. 
So it's centered around this area. Why is it called the right bank? Well, as you're going up the Gironde estuary, what's on your right-hand side is, of course, the right bank. Now, again, this is what people will call it. So unlike our experiences in southern Rome, in Chateauneuf de Pop, in Burgundy, we get a very English word to hang our hat on and know what's going on, the right bank of Bordeaux. Now, if you wanted the bonus credit, you would memorize saint Emilion and Palmeral. There's these two tiny little villages that this area, uh, the, that is the most significant area of uh, producing regions of this area. But I think more important and of interest to us in the glass is that in the right bank, you switch and suddenly you have Merlot as the dominant partner in these blends. And the backing partner is Cabernet Franc. Now I hope to get to explaining this family more in the third lecture of the series, but I realize I've gone on a lot. And again, I like people drinking wine and listening as well, but drinking wine. So we'll just say Merlot becomes the dominant partner here. Well, why Merlot? The interesting thing here is that suddenly your soil changes and changes quite dramatically, and it goes to almost exclusively clay soils. And Merlot has a real affinity for clay. Now, I know that's really, for me, because I don't have a green thumb, that's really weird to think about, but I think for people who are gardeners, they can totally understand that certain plants like certain areas to be planted whether it's the soil or whether it's the aspect of the sunshine that hits them, they perform better and enjoy being in that place more. Here in Wisconsin, where we have a fairly cool climate, the obvious one to always know about is tomatoes. Of course, it varies from person to person, but I'd suggest to you where tomatoes are planted affects the sunlight that they're getting, which will affect how much they photosynthesize. It affects how much heat they're getting, and then also what nutrients they can pull up from the soil. So some tomatoes are really dramatic and other tomatoes aren't. So here, over in this area, Merlot has a strong affinity for the clay soils. And clay is the dominant soil type here. And in fact, in Pomerol, it's almost entirely clay. And one sort of sub-tasting we could do is explore the amazing wines of Pomerol as an essay in clay as a soil type, because there are three different colors. And you can feel how it changes them in the wine. Okay, let's taste our example, which is La Confession. One thing I think you can immediately notice about this wine that changes from the Les Ormes, and this was purposeful, it wasn't meant to say one wine was better than the other, but here on the nose is the big black fruit of Merlot. Pomerol and actually, and saint Emilion, not actually, but Pomerol and saint Emilion are one of the few places in this world where Merlot to me can obtain a pronounced smell, meaning that it smells really explosively. And that's one of the reasons I absolutely love it. And here, I think that's a great example of it and showcases it. But it changes because it gives us the black fruit character versus the red we had here versus the um, a little bit of earthiness that we had here. So different that way. Mm. The other thing that always identifies the right bank and Merlot together to me in tasting these wines is that it's one of the few places where Merlot gets structure, meaning that it has some tannic intensity and some acidic intensity to the palate. And I love both of those things. Now, Merlot in the US is poo-pooed these days, and I can understand why. Merlot has a tendency, or an ability, you might say, to get very ripe. But in the US, it will lose then its tannin and its acidity, typically, and make a wine that's really maybe somewhat sugary and kind of flabby. Uh, so Merlot hasn't achieved its main position that it once held 15 years ago in the US. The funny thing for me is Saint Emilion is often, or the right bank, including Pomerol and Saint Emilion, is often such great wine that we here at Waterford Vine tend to sell a lot of it while we sell very, very little Merlot. 
And I also, I always wonder if those customers buying right bank lines realize that they are actually mostly Merlot. Now, it's funny there because, you know, am I pulling a hoodwink on a customer? Or is Merlot just something incredibly special over in the right bank? Now, the right bank has some other interesting comparisons. And if you ever go to Bordeaux, I would suggest you visit it. And this relates to the point that I talked about of the commercialism of Bordeaux and how it's different. The left bank was very much and still very much is commercialized. It was commercialized by the British way back in the 12th century, but reignited once the Dutch drained the Medoc. And again, that continues to this day. There are complaints about the left bank wines that I've heard over the years of, I, that I've been selling wine. Some of those complaints have been that the wines are now made for Americans, meaning that they are riper and more extracted. I used to hear that very heavily about 10 years ago, parkerized wines, people would say. Now there are complaints that the wines are made for the Chinese. So whether they're made for the Chinese, the Americans, or the British, the Medoc is a place where the estates are quite large. The production is quite large. The famous names that you read about sell and make a lot of wine. This is very different than in Burgundy, and it's also very different than in the right bank. The right bank tends to be very small producers that have very small plots. A difference is the most famous Pomerol um, on the right bank would be Petrus, and I think it makes maybe a thousand cases a year, and that's it. Whereas one of the most famous, and I certainly love this one as well, large estates in the Medoc, Latour, I think has the capacity to make over 100,000 cases a year. So there's a vast difference between these two. I also like to point out, and again, I think it's fun if you tour, but I think it also gives an insight into the wine. The right bank was actually never conquered by the British. And you'll see it on the labels, and you'll see it often portrayed on the labels, because many of the labels actually make reference to the Catholic Church. And many of the wineries will still make reference to the Catholic Church. Here, La Confession is obvious, and the Catholic Knights flags flying are obvious as well. Well, so what's going on there is when the British had conquered this area, they did not conquer Pomerol and saint emilion and France is a fairly result Catholic country, and so this area remained very strongly Catholic and proud for it. So again, there's a cultural difference here in the right bank that I think informs the wines, making it interesting. While it gets lumped together all as Bordeaux, I would caution you and say, explore these wines separately, both because of their grape cepage and also because of their historical tradition, and finally, because of how they taste. On to flight two.